meet uh, link. Uh -huh. We already know about uh, we already know about that. So uh, if you can simply copy the Zoom link, yeah. I don't mean that we are going to Google Meet. No, Zoom is already great. I mean copy paste the link so that, um, so that if someone is missing, they will be able to join us. Yeah, yeah, I know we did that, but you know. Uh, we couldn't uh, announce the uh, Zoom link to the students until we, we get approved from University of uh, Ferdowsi Mashhad because mm -hmm. you are the lecturers. If you uh, approve the link and you know the link, we can introduce it to our students and announce it in order to join us. Otherwise, there is a gap would be. So I'm waiting from Professor Majid, the coordinator with your university, to inform me that everything is okay with you and the Zoom link is announced from your university and the schedule is changed also. And I inform my chancellor and the dean of the colleges in order to, to announce it to the students. This is a process uh, delayed a little bit, but inshallah, everything will be okay. I see. Well, yes, it has been announced uh, yesterday uh, afternoon and this morning. Yeah, yeah. So it has been already announced, uh, but um, most of the students has saw the previous uh, posters and all which had the Google Meet version. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh... I beg your pardon. I just want to make a call for the our, our chancellor and the deans in order to join us. Just yeah, sure. I will be waiting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hello, everyone else. Let me see. Uh, here we got Fatima, Saba, Salam and Salah, and Zahra, Haura, Ali, Hassan, Yasmin. Welcome aboard, Rahab, everyone. Some of you already know you have been either my student at Ferdusi University. And if you have any, anything to ask, just please don't shy away simply type it in the chat box um as you know my presentation is about adaptation study so it would be great to tell me if you know about adaptation study is there anything that you know about adaptation study yes no You can easily type in the chat box. What is adaptation anyway? So if you have any problem in hearing my voice or something, just let me know. Uh, also, I talk English in a fast pace. So let me know when I am moving so fast. So I will be, I'll make it slower. Definitely. And let me come to the chat. All good. Transforming novels in, and literary works into films. Thank you, Hara. This is one interpretation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the basic thing that everyone thinks that turning novels, changing literature from text to screen. Thank you, Hassan. Mm -hmm. Good point. And um, how many of you are students of English? Are you students of English literature or English in general? 
And how many of you are not? You can type in the chat box. Okay. Me too. Thank you very much, Hara. I'm equally excited. And uh, let me see if most of you are students of English literature or English in general. Um, And according to Linda Hutchin, oh, wow, Salah, great. The process to make the literary works fix the environment in a certain society, the cultural and political and social aspect. Wow, I'm thrilled. So you already know a lot. This is uh, Linda Hutchin, Leish, Cartmel. All of them would be very influential critics in the realm of adaptation, good points. And who else? Uh, let me see. Oh, so uh, this is what Salah is referring to is uh, mostly, we call that appropriation. But this is also a great point to mention. Uh, this is mostly appropriation uh, because we got a sort of, there is a spectrum between adaptation and appropriation. Good point. And what do you expect from this lecture? Let me know. How many of you has been, have been like, uh, have been subjected to adaptation or no adaptation? Well, I guess all of you have seen adaptations in one way or another. Any idea so far? So example is the Iranian movie. Great, thank you, Salah. Furushande, which is the adaptation of um, Arthur Bella's Death of a Salesman. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, there are a lot of critics who are mentioning that, come on, it's not really an adaptation. Uh, this is one of the basic challenges in adaptation studies, yeah, sure. That it's not easy to draw a line. Where is adaptation? And where we call something adaptation and where we say, no, it is not adaptation anymore. This is a good question to think about. And I think uh, the audience is a mixture of BA student, MA student, and MA graduate. Did I understand that correctly? Yes or no? So BA student, MA student, and MA graduate, is that, am I correct? And uh, how many of you are English literature, not English in general? I'm not sure, I think so. I see, I see. Thank you, Sala. Me, English literature, good. And are you also familiar with Arabic adaptations? We have a very good example of Arabic adaptation of Jane Eyre, Charlotte Brentes Jane Eyre, adapted by Hilmi. Uh, an Egyptian director. Have a the, the man I love. Yes, exactly. Exactly. 
and adaptation of crime and punishment also. Oh, howra. Adaptation of crime and punishment is also available in the, by the Egyptian cinema, I guess. Can you tell me the Arabic word, the Arabic title? But I think it is almost the same. The translation is the same, crime and punishment. And let me guess, we got numerous adaptations of William Shakespeare as well. Exactly, Ali. Yes. Um, very good. I'm thrilled already. Yes. So. Hello, doctor. I'm back again. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, doctor. Okay, doctor. I called them, but uh, they uh, said that some students have lectures now and they will join us uh, shortly when they finish the lectures. And the lecture already is recorded and they will upload it uh, on the YouTube. So all students will see it later, inshallah. So can you start now? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know? sure, definitely. Okay, okay. So. Doctor. Good morning, everyone. Welcome aboard. This is Azra Gandahar Yun. I am an associate professor in literature and comparative studies. And let me use arrow pointer. So we will be helping this all to uh, once I want to I want to refer to something special with the laser point. So I am Azra Gandahar Yun. Uh, an associate professor in English literature and culture studies, and also the head of academic international collaboration sector at Ferguson University of Russia. And what this slide, the first one is going to tell us about the adaptation with this cool William Shakespeare going on a bowling from 16th century coming to 21st century. So literature and cinematic adaptation. Uh, let us move forward. The cheese of my today's presentation are going to be summarized in these uh, parts. Adaptation, I mean, what is the adaptation? Uh, and the definition is very fluid, difficult actually to be defined. Fallacy, and we got uh, different examples of adaptation from the movies, uh, also from my own experience in the class. So this is welcoming you aboard to Alice Adventure in the Wonderland. Needless to mention that Alice Adventure, here I got this, uh, uh, this picture, has been also adapted numerous times. So once upon a time, adaptation. Um, we got whenever we want to think about adaptation, the term itself is difficult to be defined. Adaptation basically is a literal reading of an already existing text. Sometimes adaptations are more readerly, sometimes they are more writerly. More writerly adaptations are called appropriations. I brought you some examples I mean, so that I can show them to you. One is Alice Adventure in the Wonderland. See, look, this is Alice Adventure in the Wonderland. This is Alice Adventure in the Wonderland. And all of you know that Lewis Carroll, 19th century, has written that for the kids. Now let's take a look at the book. See, what do you see? What is written inside that? You can easily type. See, it's white. Nothing is written there. Hmm? So it is only a cover. 
This is a sort of a notebook that you keep your notes there, but it looks like it is modeled exactly out of you know, the first book, Alice Adventure in the Wonderland in 19th century. So this is one good example of adaptation. I mean, adaptation as a fluid term. Is it really Alice Adventure? Uh, not exactly. And yes, it is. So let us come to the definition of readerly and writerly. Readerly texts, to put it in a nutshell, simplify that, means that they are written for the readers. So readers can easily understand it. Um, or let's say they are reader friendly text. Um, a lot of novels in 19th century, like Dickens novels, Gaskell's novels, um, Jane Austen's novels, they are considered as readerly novels. There's not too many complicated terms. Once you read them, you will understand what the writer wants to say. They might be psychological in a way. Uh, they might be um, expressive. I mean, uh, describing and descriptive, describing all the things happening in a novel. But in the end, it's not very difficult for you to get the point. Uh, now, Ratley is exactly the opposite so it is very complicated it is actually um according to the i mean the writer is ri writing that in a, in a way that the reader has to think so much work so hard use a lot of uh, gray cells to to decipher to decode what the writer wants to say. Now, can you give me some examples of the writerly text? Those of you who are student of English literature, what are the texts which were very difficult for you to understand? Give me some examples. You can also give me the example of a specific, maybe term or a school, which is talking about uh, which is having some writers that the writers are like very difficult to be understood. So any example of Rattley text? So in the chat box, this is about the previous question, but this is again wonderful, Brother Karmazov, Egyptian cinema. Okay, so anyone, some examples, any of difficult text, which we call them writerly. I'll give you a hint. Most of modernist writers are very good example. Yes, surrealism, very good style. great. A lot of modernist writers also, T.S. Eliot. A best example for writerly text would be James Joyce, his Finnegan's Wake, his Ulysses, not the Dubliners. Dubliner is not that difficult, but James Joyce's uh, Ulysses, wow, very complicated. And let me see, stream of consciousness, very good. Um, so a lot of novels that are 100 years of solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, great, great. So whenever the thing is getting, I mean, the, the work is getting complicated for you, um, and it needs a lot of a struggle of the reader. This is called writerly text. And to summarize that, whenever we think of appropriation, appropriation is writerly. So once you are watching the movie, it's even hard for you, the movie or you're reading the novel, which is the adaptation of a picture, a photo, or whatever, then it is hard for you to really decipher, to really decode what was work A that this work B is adapting that. So this is called appropriation. And the term is what? Recontextualize. So you are putting the work, I mean, taking the work, William Shakespeare, 
Bob, James, Joyce, whoever, and then you're putting that into a different context. We call that contextualization, recontextualization. So it has different culture, different setting, maybe different historical era. I mean, adaptation of William Shakespeare in Great Britain in 21st century. The nationality of the, the, the writer, the, the dramatist is the same, but it again must be recontextualized because four centuries has been passed. Therefore, when we think in terms of uh, adaptation appropriation, here we uh, come across a uh, uh, spectrum. So on the one side, we got adaptation, which is readerly. Look at this cute William Shakespeare. I mean, in the end, when you look at that, well, it is William Shakespeare. It might be William Shakespeare for children, but it is William Shakespeare. On the other hand, we got appropriation. Uh, this is also, I recommend you to, to take a look. I mean, this is really good. Uh, this William Shakespeare in the Arab word. And you see William Shakespeare is wearing kefir. So this is like a very different way of looking at William Shakespeare. And therefore, this is more or less appropriation. Uh, then we come to the significance of adaptation appropriation. So there is this long academic dialogue. Who stands first. You can type in the chat box. When we got an adaptation, it means that first work A was there and then came work B. So does that mean that work A is original and work B is, hmm, it is secondary. Why? Because, well, they didn't write it themselves. They have taken that from William Shakespeare, for example, or James Joyce or Arthur Miller. Now, can you tell me what does that really mean? No voice at all? You don't have my voice? Ah, you say it's clear. So you have to check up uh, your own internet connection. So let me ask my question again. When work A, uh, I mean, work B is the adaptation of work A. Do we call work B inferior or secondary? Because, I mean, first there was work A and then came work B. Yes, no, why? Any idea? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you, Hara. So the people used to think like that. Everyone, the people who watch movies, the people who would go for the video games, the people who would, um, and the, the critics, everyone used to call that adaptation is inferior to the work because we've got original work which is the, the work, I'm in A, whatever, and then we got adaptation of work B. But in the 21st century, things were changed. Why? The theorists in adaptation study, I mean, actually the theorists were started uh, like 2007, 2008, mostly 2000, well, seven, eight or something. So adaptation studies is, uh, a very, very new topic almost because it is like in 21st century. According to Western canon, the second work is inferior in the original one. Okay, Salo. It has been what everyone has been saying, but adaptation studies has tried to prove in a different way. They said that, okay, we are challenging this notion of authority and authenticity with the help of two important theories. One is death of the author, Barth, and the other one is Julia Kristeva's intertextuality. Death of the authors, it doesn't really mean that the authors are dead or killed. Uh, it means that, if someone knows, just let me know in the chat box. It means that once you are the author, 
and you have written your text finished, it's published, then you cannot say, I have the authority over the text. So I wanted you to get that specific interpretation or to, to, to read the text like that, or this, this character is the symbol of this or that. No, once you have written the text, that's it. So with the birth of the reader comes a prize. The birth of the reader happens at the cost of death of the author. This is what Barth says. So it means because the reader can decide on the text, can read the text, and infer from the text or from the sociopolitical background of the text, the author, which used to be the god uh, of the text, is not the god of the text anymore. I mean, once the creation of the text is finished. And then another one, the liberation of the reader. Thank you very much, Zahra. And then we got intertextuality. Intertextuality that some of you might be aware of, intertextuality also by, it has been introduced by uh, Kristeva and Jeanette. Intertextuality also means that nothing original exists. Kristeva says that all texts are mosaics or citations of other texts. We do not have anything called original. Look at William Shakespeare, the guy that everyone has been translating him, everyone has been adapting him all over the world. It has been claimed that every day articles are written and published on William Shakespeare. Adaptations are abound everywhere. William Shakespeare, he has taken the plot of most important, most, most popular works from everywhere. Sometimes he has been adapting things. I mean, putting two or three plots together, mixing them together and making one plot. And sometimes they have been one plot already. I mean, look at Hamlet, King Lear, Macbeth. Uh, we got also historical plays. Look at uh, Richard III, for example. So they have been either written in history and he is changing the history, adapting the history, or they have been said by the previous writers. Uh, so that is why some people may even call that, that he was, oh, uh, he, was, uh, he was very genius in the way that he could just steal things from here and there. So uh, T.S. Eliot says that, um, well, the, the, the great writers are stealing. However, the weak writers, they are borrowing. So he was a great writer. And if there is any question, everyone, if I'm speaking on a fast pace, just let me know. Uh, uh, let us go to the next slide. No questions so far? No? Okay. Um, adaptation and appropriation. Here I brought you some books. Uh, the Theory of Adaptation, Linda Hutchin, the second edition. This is the first edition. Uh, Simon Mori, uh, The Adaptation Industry by Rothlich. This is also a very good book. And uh, also uh, Julie Sanders, Adaptation and Appropriation. I will show you the book cover in the next slide. Uh, I also need to uh, tell you that uh, adaptation may look something new, the outcome of late 20th and early 21st century, but it is not exactly. I mean, Horace, an arts poetica, has been talking about adaptation even in that time. Um, so many books related to adaptations, related to movies going far back to Bluestone are talking about adaptation, but most of the uh, academic creation were based on this idea that adaptations are inferior and the first work, I mean, the original work is superior. However, I discussed, uh, I mean, I, have, uh, I argued otherwise. Uh, Sanders' work is more literature-based, 
And it is highly depending on the theories of intertextuality, which you already know I have explained. And this is the first um, uh, edition, and this is the second one. Um, and he says that literature, she says that literature creates other literature, and she's mostly focusing on the idea of pleasure. Um, so when we are seeing something that we already know the plot, then it gives us extra pleasure. Wow, I already know the plot. So I want to know what happens next. I want to know how the writer has been changing that or shifting that. Um, so he says, she says that pleasure uh, in adaptation and progression are the fundamental um, to, to the practice of adaptation and the enjoyment of literature. So actually, um, adaptation is used uh, more or less as uh, a method for, 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 for teaching uh, students everything. I mean, be it vocabulary, be it language or anything. I have uh, added some theorists in adaptation studies, 21st century, Deborah Kotman, Linda Hutchin, Julie Sanders, Toby Miller, uh, Robert Stamm, Brian uh, McFarlane, Themis Leitch. Hamid Nafisi is mostly um, expert in cinema and post-colonial studies, Middle Eastern cinema and Iranian cinema. As you see in the list, we got this long list. They are ranging from film studies critics, culture studies, gender studies, image studies, so adaptation is an interdisciplinary endeavor. So everyone from all over the world, um, from different walks of life are talking about adaptation. Um, as I've already said that adaptation is very challenging in being explained uh, because uh, the expression can be separated from, the, I mean, the form and the content can be, uh, I mean, they try to separate themselves uh, because they say that, see, this is the story of Hamlet, but Hamlet is written on a piece of paper. Now I want to turn it into a play. Or Hamlet is originally a play, but I want to turn it into a novel. So this is actually a biggest challenge in adaptation studies that we don't know where things are. Um, we think that the uh, the content, which is the idea or the plot, is more important than the form because form is always changing. And uh, so the story is the core and we got uh, a very important key term, which is transcoding. And by transcoding would mean that the media has changed. The genre has changed. It is very common. Can you give me some example of changes in the genre? I can give you a hint, William Shakespeare. Imagine that William Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet is going to be adapted for the children. Do you think they will have all the chilling and the tragedy? Or Romeo and Juliet would happily uh, marry ever after, marry, huh? Any idea? So this is very probable. Yes, it's very probable that we got this shift in the genre. And uh, we got parody, which is what definitely the genre has changed. Uh, tragedy uh, turns into comedy. So um, each of these types of transcoding are uh, dealing with different ways, different modes of uh, engaging. We got uh, narrating, mode of engagement, which is like I mean, novel, short story, whatnot. We got performing or performative mode of engagement, like performing, like drama, like movie, opera. And we got interactive, like video games. I mean, you are uh, you're physically taking part in the adaptation of, for example, Godfather or uh, Lord of Rings. Mm -hmm. And this is the important um, uh, summary gist of everything that I mentioned. So 
transcoding, you see that we got adaptation. So adaptation, we got text and characters. In appropriation, we got indigenization. Indigenization, uh, it means that it makes uh, the, the new work, the adapted work, fitting the different culture. And we got transcode, I already talked about that, and, uh, and cultural capital. By transcoding, it involves actually a shift of one medium, like poem or film, uh, or a shift in genre, I already mentioned, like an epic uh, to a novel, or a change of frame, therefore a change of context, like from 16th century William Shakespeare, it comes to 21st century, um, 21st century Arab word. And it is trying to tell the same story from a different point of view. Cultural capital is also equally important. Um, cultural capital, uh, which is actually developed by the, by the French uh, scholar, uh, it is developed as a way of explanation of why adaptation of one work continuously happens. If English was not the, were not the lingua franca, would we have a lot of adaptations of William Shakespeare? Hmm? How many of us know, I mean, everyone, I don't mean student of English literature, know uh, literary works written in English compared with literary works written in French or in, uh, in Japanese, Chinese. In my own classes, when I'm teaching to uh, my international students, basically students who come from Arab word, they know a lot of English works, but they don't know enough of Arabic works, though Arabic is their mother tongue. So this is related to cultural capital. Sometimes some works are more prestigious to be adapted. Okay. So, so this is cultural capital. Anything else? And we will move forward. Someone is drawing something on the board. No more question. Let me see what is written. Transforming from one form. Yes, thank you very much, Zahra. One form of the coding to another form. Exactly. Very good. Yes. And the next, I'm really hoping it happens. Seems not. Next slide. Do you see the next slide here or no? Anyone? Let me stop sharing and start sharing again. Okay. Yes? Do you see the slides? Huh? Okay, good, good, good. So a uh, less influential article about 12 uh, Adaptation fallacies, you see that? That is why I put this a specific picture here. So this is like the fallacy. Are we really in the dentist office or that is going to be a disco bar? Basic thing that Leish is talking about is that he is telling us that literary texts are verbal, films are visual. But this is a fallacy. By fallacy, I mean that it is something wrong. Literary texts are verbal, films are visual. No, we have a lot of literary texts which are also visual. 
they have a lot of what um they have a they have a lot of um let me use a good color um they are visual in the sense that they are they are explaining a lot about the setting about the character so they are they are visualizing for us the characterization and setting and some movies are verbal i mean we just got a lot of talks so no one i mean people are talking and, and talking or we have uh, in uh, the adaptation of sherlock holmes the bbc adaptation the british one the recent one uh, and then we see a lot of things which are written in front of uh, uh, on the screen that, for example, uh, Sherlock Holmes is typing something on his phone, and then we see that, uh, I mean, they are just written there. So, no. Um, source texts are more original than adaptation. Uh, well, I think I talked about that already. No need. Um, we don't have anything original that doesn't exist. Fiction or drama is better than films because literature is better than films uh, and uh, they're saying that no i mean they are better because they are more prestigious or the people who are reading novels and drama are more uh more learned than the people who are watching the movies do you approve of that hmm? The people who are watching movies are just, they're not really, they are, they are inferior to the people who are reading novels. Don't we got like yellow pages? Don't we get some novels who are very cheap? And a lot of people are reading those novels. And don't we have some movies which are very complicated? Hmm? So it is a fallacy. Fiction and drama, <clears throat> the characters in fiction and drama have, uh, psychological depth they are very complicated but um, in the movies no i mean the characters are flat and they cannot have psychological depth so this is another uh fallacy no characters in the cinema can be equally psychologically complicated and the other one is uh, cinema's visualization preserves audience's imagination. But no, it says that because cinema shows us everything, so we cannot we cannot imagine what the characters. I mean, our imagination is closed up. We cannot imagine what characters will do because we just see them. But can't we have them in some movies that there are the setting is dark? Absolutely, we just hear some voices, so we have to imagine things. Don't we have some writers um, who are explaining everything for us? We got that omniscient point of view, that they leave no point, um, no vague point. They explain everything. They say that this is a bad character, this is a good, good guy, the bad guy, and then. Mm, it is not you who decide. You don't need to just use your brain a lot to understand if it is a good guy or a bad guy. And this is what I have discussed a lot. Fidelity is the most appropriate criteria for analyzing. And this is one of the most long lasting, um, well, long lasting um, fallacies because the first thing that people are looking while they want to interpret an adaptation, they say that, how far is it following William Shakespeare? Or how far is it following Tennessee Williams? No, this is definitely wrong. We shouldn't follow if, if an adaptation is going to be the exact copy paste of the original work, then why? bother why bother watching the adaptation if it is not going to uh, going to tell us anything new okay uh, let us move to the next slide
Um, I talked a bit already fallacy, uh, and there are two other things. One is, is saying that actually there is such a thing as contemporary adaptation theory. Well, no. There are people who try to bring different adaptation theory of talking about adaptation theory. The best of all is Linda Hutchins, a theory of adaptation, but she says that a theory, a theory, not their theory. So um, it is not as clear cut as the other one, like we say semiotics, for example. We don't have that. Uh, one reason is that because it's interdisciplinary and another it's new. Adaptation is a marginal enterprise. Uh, well, in the beginning, like early 20th century, yes, it was a marginal enterprise, but uh, right now it is turning into something really a main idea. Is there any ideology behind adaptation of any Western literary works? Yes, Salah, thank you for asking such a good question. Definitely they are. It is related to cultural capital. As I told you, when we got a Western work, uh, because the Western work is more important or people call that it is more well-known, they are continuously adapted. And that is why I have just put you this photos here, different types of adaptation. So this is a shoe, but this shoe, what the story of this shoe narrates is very much different with this shoe. I mean, this is a stiletto. It shows that this is like a, the name of the, what the name of this, uh, this shoe was, was the car simply, okay, car. But the name of this shoe, the title that this shoe was winning was Gold Digger. So you know that Gold uh, Digger is just the name given to some women who are beautiful and then they are, they are looking for rich men to pay for them. So this is what it says. So all of them are shoes, but the way they are narrating is like very different. The way they are narrating the story of adaptation is very different. Okay, so uh, what is important about, uh, about uh, any adaptation as you see in the next slide is that um, adapters are first and foremost interpreters. So first, whatever we see in any adaptation is the interpretation of a person. So it is the interpretation of a person and it is not any type of interpretation, but a creative type of interpretation. Okay. So uh, that is why we call the adapters interpretive creation or creative interpreters. I have brought also two good, two other good examples. These are the statues um, of Michelangelo's, and you know that they were not dressed up. And this is the new way. I mean, they're like chic and dressed up in a different way. This is another example of adaptation, which is the advertisement of, can you see it? The advertisement of Nason, the, the, the car industry. And uh, this is like, it, it reveals the strength of, of the car. And this is another example of adaptation. As you remember what I told you already, adaptation is having a, having a very, very wide um, understanding uh, and interpretation. Of, we've got a very wide uh, uh, interpretation of adaptation. Even plagiarism is called uh, adaptation. I mean, this is one of the best types of adaptation because uh, it is like a copy paste. It is one of the most, uh, Fiddle adaptation, fidelity, you remember? So when we are thinking too much about fidelity, uh, this is not recommended actually. Okay, so the objective ad adaptation is that it explores multiple versions of one story. And 
uh, adaptations are derived from, this is a very important point, but never derivative, never second rate. They are original works by themselves. So they are the products, the original products by themselves. That is why fidelity, though it has been like a, a long term, which has been, I mean, a lot of people has been mentioning that it has not been really an issue, especially in 21st century. Okay, so here I brought you good examples, multiple versions of the same story. What is that everyone? Very easy to say. Multiple versions of one story. All of them are Hamlet. Yeah. Weird looking shoes. Yeah, these are like different types of adaptations. So we got Hamlet. And look at different types of Hamlet that we have here. Like almost every, every type of Hamlet that we see. So this is Sarah Bernard, uh, one of the most famous actresses of her time. And this is another adaptation of Hamlet, a painting. And this is simply a quark. I mean, what we think this is made for children. And then we come to another type of adaptation. Again, Hamlet. And so what is this one? Again, I'm saying that the multiple, uh, multiple stories, multiple stories. Uh, sorry, multiple versions of, of one story. So the story is the same, but we've got multiple versions. One is this type of Hamlet, who is saying that to like or not to like. If Hamlet was written today, that would be the different version of Hamlet. Um, this is also another Hamlet. Um, this Hamlet, oh, let me show that to you. This Hamlet, this one. This is called Al Hamlet Summit by Al Bassam, Suleiman Al Bassam. It is a narrating a crumbling Arab dictatorship. Uh, and um, it says that um, the, the government, we got a lot of car bombs and everything. We got rebellion of the people of the South. There is this international army at the border and they want to just invade that Arab country. We don't know what country is that. And there is this English speaking arm dealer um, and Claudius is also involved in dealing with arms, Fortinbras Gertrude, uh, and we got Islamist Hamlet, and in the end, Ophelia commits suicide by becoming the suicidal bummer. So this is a very um, indigenized adaptation of Hamlet. So the story is the same thing, but, uh, but the way that it is narrated is very, very different. This is also Hamlet in the Arab word, uh, sorry, Shakespeare in the Arab word, as you see in this picture. This is Shakespeare, William Shakespeare for children in Iran. And we got a lamb who was playing Hamlet. He says to eat or not to eat lettuce. And this is, uh, this is the ghost of the father. This is another Hamlet, the Arabic Hamlet. So you see, we got many uh, different versions of one story. And we go to the next one. Mm -hmm. So I already talked about all the fallacies and cliches. Uh, the most important fallacy, which is telling us that actually um, source texts are more original and adaptations, uh, I mean, literature is better than films or movies, is rooted in our uh, long held beliefs, which we have been already taught uh, at school. So if someone is writing something, this is good. But if someone is painting something, that is said, okay, this is like 
children's work. Come on, it's, it's nothing serious. So it is embedded in our iconophobia and logophilia. Logo means the language. I mean, it comes from logos. So it means that we all love words or written things. But when it comes to um, when it comes to icons, which is like images and pictures, we think that they are inferior. Mm -hmm. So I brought you some examples, Pride and Prejudice, you're all familiar with that, Kara Knightley. And then we got this Indian version of that, Pride and Prejudice. Interestingly, uh, in India, they cannot pronounce pe, so instead of uh, pride, they say bride. And we got Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, um, which is the adaptation of Jane Austen, I mean, a novel into a novel, but um, the genre has changed. Okay. No questions so far? And let's just move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So multiple versions of one story. Again, I repeat, this is Jane Austen, Kibriya uh, Bahawa. It has not been adapted in the Arab word, but uh, I'm sure you already know that. Uh, this uh, Arabic uh, version of Emma was very interesting because if you search the net, you will hardly see that Emma is wearing a scarf. But here Emma does wear a scarf. Mm -hmm. because they want to adapt it for their Arab audience. Or this one is that Bollywood meets Hollywood, and it's a perfect adaptation. So Bollywood in India and Hollywood, Pride and Prejudice, and that how Pride and Prejudice turns into Bride and Prejudice. And then I brought, so this is, I am moving to the last stage of my slides, my presentation today. So these are some examples from, uh, from my class, actually. Um, I have asked my students to draw Elizabeth Bennett for me and tell me uh, what is like the, the first line of uh, the, the opening of uh, Pride and Prejudice. So what do they, they say about that? So it is a truth universally uh, acknowledged that a single man in position of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. So this is uh, the beautiful Elizabeth Bennet, as we think, well, the student thought. Uh, and this is another Elizabeth Bennet. It says that uh, this is Elizabeth and she is poor. And it says that uh, the poverty line and my father doesn't let, let us be together. This is Mr. Darcy. And this is uh, Elizabeth, do not leave me alone. So it turns very romantic and it turns into a money issue. Uh, so this is one, stu one student's adaptation. Uh, another one, this is another Elizabeth Bennett. You might be interested. <laughs> These are two other Elizabeth Bennett that for me, it was very, uh, very odd. I was never expecting that type of Elizabeth, but the student had, uh, I mean, my student says to talk a lot that why does she represent Elizabeth Bennett? My student claimed that this is like a, a superwoman Elizabeth Bennett, but well, as you see in my responses, it is totally odd for me. And we got some other adaptations. Of Elizabeth Bennett and Pride and Prejudice. This one. This is actually what I've uh, told everyone, I mean, students to write, and that was a sort of exam. And I said that, suppose you are rich, handsome Mr. Darcy. 
proposed to Elizabeth Bennet in a way that she will say yes instantly. The story goes like, there is this guy, Mr. Darcy. She asks Elizabeth to marry her, but the first time she says no, the second time she says yes. Now I said that you have to adapt it, you have to change it in the way that she will say yes on the spot. And then you have to bring this example why she, uh, she says yes. Or number two, the second option is that write her a letter that she says no and she never ever changes her idea. Now, this is one good example. Someday it was, as I sat in front of the mirror, I heard my mother call asking me to come for dinner. So this is the mama's boy. And then definitely Elizabeth would not go for Darcy. This is one Dorothy desperately in love with Elizabeth. Well, uh, the Elizabeth doesn't look very sexy though, not very beautiful or not very bright. She looks almost like a witch, but my students brought different examples. This was another, dearest darling Elizabeth, I've fallen in love with you. I am very rich, but, Uh, I'm not gonna talk about it because I am so humble and I know you don't crave much about the money, um, but if you're gonna marry me, I can promise you a life full of wealth. So I have attached a photo of the place uh, we are gonna live. And this is like a very beautiful photo. So Darcy says that I am very rich and Elizabeth will definitely marry her. Um, so he's going to entice Elizabeth because of money, joy, and happiness. And if you have any question, you can just type them down in the chat box. And then, and this is like one, the other one. Uh, you look so good. I kind of like you. This is actually, uh, Elizabeth has been invited to a chic coffee shop. Uh, we can share some coffee time. Uh, it would be nice. And this is how we got a lot of emojis. Maybe your future husband, partner. Okay. And it has been also signed. So thank you very much uh, for your participation. If you have any question, I will be more than happy to have you on board. Let me see. Okay. So yes, any question? I've seen a hand. I've seen a raised hand. You're always welcome. So we got two versions of questioning. The tough questions and the easy questions. Let me know. Okay, this is the tough question and this is the sweet question. So which slide do you prefer? Ask the questions. Thank you very much. For your participations, you have been such active participants. Wonderful, you too. Thank you. Okay, yes, I'm ready if someone wants to ask. I remember that Salah had a question before regarding the cultural capital. This is one big issue. Um, only the works which are considered from post-colonial perspective, which are considered um, canonical works, basically written in English. Uh, so they're basically based in North America or Europe are adapted. However, other works like the Arab Arabic works are not adapted a lot. Uh, other Asian works are not adapted a lot. Hardly ever we see the adaptation beside English text or canonical text like William Shakespeare's text, like James Joyce, for example. But 
uh, Ahmed Saad Ali's Frankenstein, which is originally uh, an adaptation of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It has great potentials to be adapted, but we don't see it adapted. Or Gilgamesh, also very intriguing, yet we got uh, Beowulf adapted rather than Gilgamesh. If there is any other question, I will be more than happy to answer. So we got mostly students from the department and uh, uh, colleagues and students from the Department of English Literature. Again, I will introduce myself. I am Azra Andahariyur, an Associate Professor of um, English Literature and Comparative Culture Studies, and also the head of um, International Academic Collaboration Sector. Hello, Salam. all my colleagues back there at Basra University. Assalamu alaikum, Ms. Azra. Assalamu alaikum. Kaifa haluka? Kaifa haluka? Sawah al khair. Shona saha al ahwal. Shukran. ما أدري أتكلم وياكم بالعربي أو بالإنجليزي أو بال. آه بالإنجليزي لطفاً يعني أنا أفهم اللغة العربية ولكن أنا لا أنا كمثل الطفل يعني أنا أم أنا أفهم كثيراً من الكلمات ولكن لا أستطيع أن أتكلم. واضح. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice, interesting lecture, which have very good stimulation for our staff and students. I am Dr. Saad Shaheen, the Chancellor of Basra University. And I, I am watching the lecture from the start till now. It is very nice lecture, very interactive, very I'm informative Thank for, you. for our students. And uh, we appreciate your cooperation with our university and we hope that this cooperation will continue. And we want to thank you very much for your time and uh, uh, efforts in this lecture. We hope that this uh, lecture will continue for weekly or at least for the end of this year. Our uh, great thanks to your colleagues uh, and to all the staff in your university. And we hope that this collaboration between our university and your university will continue and expand to other uh, branches. Thank you very much again, and you are welcome to visit our university, Basra, and to visit uh, Karbala and Najaf if you wish at any time. This is an open invitation for you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shukran Jazilan. Thank you very much for all your warm words. And I had fantastic audience. They were very informative and, and helping. I mean, they're, they're, they're just, our discussions were very informative, and I really Enjoy that and as for the last adaptation I will show everyone this has been one of my students has been bringing me for that from Iraq and this is another type of adaptation according to different adaptations that I explained today. This is very interesting because here maybe you don't see that but different uh, states of Iraq has been actually shown in here and this is very much related to Najaf and Karbala definitely. We hope that you will visit uh, it actually, not electronically, our university and uh, Najaf. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much. And I leave the uh, space for other students or our colleagues if they have anything else. And goodbye to you again in the next lecture, inshallah. Goodbye. Ma salama. Alhamdulillah. Goodbye. So if there is any question, thank you. I have tons of yes, grateful uh, messages. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. May I? Uh, Hello, Dr. Amal. Am I, am I pronouncing your name correctly? No, no. Amal, I am, I am Amal? Abbas al-Maliki. Abbas al-Maliki. From Abbas. the Department of English Education in Kurna, yes. Great. It's a pleasure listen to your wonderful uh, lecture and really uh, interesting topic and uh, as you know we are teaching uh, english novel in uh, 
to our uh, undergraduates at the University of Basra, departments of English. And uh, this topic is really interesting for us and for our students, for us as teachers and for our students. Uh, and actually, I would like to share with you uh, a humble experience that we have done in the, the Department of English, uh, which is uh, an adaptation of uh, great expectation uh, by Dickens into a, a pictorial way uh, that we uh, transformed uh, a, a university hall. We named the, uh, the, the hall a great expectation hall. And then we uh... I'm sorry, Dr. Abbas, can you unmute yourself, please? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Dr. Abbas, can you just unmute yourself in order to continue? Uh, we have heard that uh, the hall was great expectation. The experience was very exhilarating. Yes. Would you please continue? Great expectation hall and uh, you are muted. Unfortunately, you are muted, Dr. Abbas. Would you please unmute yourself? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, as I said uh, in 2018, okay. Uh, together, we made a project, like a project. We adapted uh, a hall at the university campus. We, we named the hall a Great Expectations Hall after, the, after uh, the novel by Dickens. Then we adapted the event of the novel chapter by chapter into pictures, okay? That is, we adapted the, the text into pictures. Each uh, scene, each chapter of the novel, uh, we summarize it into a picture of the novel. And you know, the Great Expectations has been adapted as a, a, a movie and uh, as a, a TV series, and we adopted it into pictures, okay? So my question is, how do you evaluate our humble experience in this uh, regard? First of all, I'm really thrilled by this wonderful experience. Um, we had such experience at Ferdusi University. And for my experience is that students would be very much motivated. And for teachers, it is very helpful that they can teach students, especially something like Great Expectation by Dickens, which is a hard book to read read and it is well, it is very lengthy and got a lot of characters so my students always mix things up together so you have done a great job uh Thank and i'm you. really happy to to be acquainted with you also something that uh, i do back there at here at Ferdusi university with my graduate students is that i'm always inviting them to go to comparative literature english and arab culture so uh, yes. with the existence of a lot of students from Iraq, a lot of great literary works from uh, Iraqi culture uh, or Arab culture in general had came to Ferdusi University, which is very rare compared with other universities in Iran or even other universities in the Middle East, as far as I know. And that is really... Um, a great experience, which is also related to um, adaptation. Basically, the adaptation of Arabic works um, or English works into Arabic movies, let's say, has been hardly covered. So it has also yes. great potentials for academic collaboration as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azra. It's really, uh, though I just... Uh, joined the, the lecture uh, late, but it, it seemed really interesting. Uh, we request you, kindly request you to repeat such wonderful uh, presentation and wonderful lecture for us, especially for- The same thing? You mean the same the lecture? The same lecture or a different one? The same one? The same or different one, up to you. Uh -huh. Okay. The, the same lecture is-, is, is We can, is, is, we can is, is, schedule is a timing, yes, sure. 
you can schedule the timing and then I will present it again or I will add up more more things into adaptation. If uh, the people, the, the students who has been taking part in that uh, will tell me what they need more, I mean, more explanation on which topic, I'll be also glad to add that up uh, as well. Yeah, I would love to. Why not? We wish so and we are confident that our university management will uh, coordinate the issue soon, inshallah. Yes, Thank you. inshallah. And the next Thank time, Dr. Abbas, I am also very much happy to see the adaptations of your students as well. Um, so we can have a lecture I hope together. Once a time, I hope once a time when the COVID-19 crisis will end, uh, I will invite you to visit the hall. It is in the Garmat Ali campus of the university, and we will show you our experience. <laughs> That would be great. It would be wonderful. Definitely. Sure. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you again. Shukran jazeelan, Dr. Abbas. Dr. Abbas, salam alaikum, Dr. Abbas. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Muhammad with you. The president asking you to let the students open the question for the students, if you don't mind, please. Just oriented the students to present any question okay. to Dr. Okay. Azar. They are just uh, trying to join, uh, excuse me, Dr. We are just trying to let our- Even though, uh, even though the Boston graduate yes, students will be lovely if they okay. can ask any question, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. Yes, welcome. All the questions are welcome. My name is Azra, by the way, or Azra. So that is A-Z-R-A-R-A, -A -R -A. Azra. Yes. So any question? You can simply put it in the chat box. Ahmed Khirullah Talib, Hatif Mastuh. Sorry, Prof Azra. Prof yes. Azra. I think there yes. are some Ahasan, questions. Yes, there are some questions on the chat. They asking about look. what is the difference between adaptation and intertextuality, if I don't, if I remember. I see, I see. There, there the are questions many questions on the open. Uh, on the chat, please, if you don't mind to pay attention. Okay, let me see. So yes. I missed them. Uh, I thought the biggest problem people have with adaptation is accuracy. So this is Sham's question, okay? I am addressing Sham's question. I thought the biggest problem people have with adaptation, if there is any question, uh, uh, Hassan, please, uh, Dr. Hassan, please, please let me know before Sham's. This is the first question that I found. Let me see. Uh -huh. Shams is the first question that I found. I thought the biggest problem people have with adaptation is accuracy, not originality. So, okay, yes. The biggest question, it used to be in, um, let's say in 20, 20th century, uh, people thought that still right now, some people think that the biggest thing is accuracy and, and fidelity, but it is a fallacy. If you change the adaptation and turn it into something else, it is even better. Else there is no point of, of seeing or reading the thing which has been already written or, or said. So let me come to other questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Is there any difference or, or similarity between adaptation and intertextuality? Okay, Salah, thank you for your question. This means that, uh, well, to make it simple, uh, all the adaptations are intertextual in one way or another because they are referring to one work or couple of works. Yet, there are some intertextual works that they are not really adaptation, like let's say that um, Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. Uh, he is continuously referring to a lot of things. He is also self-referring. He's referring to himself, his own works. So it is basically reference, or let's say that it is a sort of illusion. But when we have adaptation, adaptation can be adaptation of one work or two works or three works all together shaped in one single work. So um, all the adaptations are intertextual in one way or another. And let me see if there is any other question. Thank you, thank you, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. So if there is any other question, 
Dr. Shana, uh, did I uh, answer your question or do you uh, have other questions regarding that? Dr. Hassan Basir, yes, you are raising your hand, please. Dr. Hassan Basir. Yes, yes. yes. Dr. Hassan? No, no, I'm not Dr. Hassan. Uh, I am asking about the movie of uh, Pride and Prejudice. Is it enough to, to watch the movie or do I, do I have to read the novel to know like the uh -huh. dance and everything? Yes. This is a great That's question awesome. for the students or for the teachers. Well, the students will always say that we prefer to watch the movie and the movie is enough. But as a teacher, I say the movie is having this preconception um try to get away from that first of all but second would be um when you think that this is the movie the movie is only one interpretation among many among billions of interpretations of the people who are reading at work so the movie is a uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice filtered by someone, uh, by the director and the, the actors and actresses and through their, the, the cultural setting and all. So uh, whenever uh, we are thinking in terms of adaptation, we have to read both of them. But at the same time, it gives us some um, extra pleasure to see, I mean, literary pleasure to see how one work is understood and interpreted differently. Basically, when we think in terms of novels, because novels are very lengthy, I um, mean, let's say with Charles Dickens novels, a lot of characters in all the adaptations are gone. Uh, a lot of characters are, are merged together and the plot is simplified sometimes. A lot of subplots are just cut away for simply the time span. So uh, definitely, yes, you have to read both of them. Okay, let me see. Uh, yes, for no one, even, I mean, for students or, uh, uh, you know, uh, faculty members already read the, read the work and watch the movie. Because we are teachers, we do our homework first. But as for the students, yes, I mean, you have to read, uh, the novel as well as watching the movie and it is very helpful for for learning english definitely this is one of the techniques that a lot of people are using um the adaptations of literary works for young adults or for um, i mean university students to learn english biased view let me see if we have some other questions uh screenwriters Biased view always comes with adaptations. Yes, Hassan. Uh, yes, Dr. Hassan, biased view, yes. In the sense that we think that adaptations are inferior, but I can give you some examples that adaptations are even better than the original work or primary work, like Beowulf. Uh, you, if you have watched the cartoon, the animated cartoon of Beowulf, I mean, Beowulf is fine. It is an interesting work, uh, old English, but a lot of uh, psychological and philosophical issues are born into the adaptation. I mean, this father-son rivalry, femme fatale, they are not really there in Beowulf. It is the interpretation of the, the director and the script writer. And the screenwriter can't help but be creative. Yes, they have to. So they make lots of changes. Exactly. I mean, they have to, else no one will watch it if it is exactly the copy paste of the novel. Oh, okay. Interesting. And adaptation makes the work much understandable. Thank you, Hara. Good point. Uh, what is the main difference between adaptation? Movie, you mean movie adaptation and the book? 
the basic difference is that the shift in the, I mean, there are a lot of differences. The basic difference, which is a must, it always happens. It is a shift in medium. I mean, we got different mediums. So yeah, definitely it has changed uh, because uh, the novel is written and the movie is, is visual, is audiovisual, is performative. But then we got other things. I mean, the movie might be, I mean, the original work might be, um, the original is not a good word to use. Work A or the first work might be a tragedy and then it might be adapted as a comedy. So the genre might be changed as well. Basically, we are expecting changes in the, um, in the form. This is the first change which happens. Okay, since we see the director or the scenarist approaches the literary work by adding or adapting it, is it still the same literary work or not? Salah, this is um, also a very good question. And this is the nature of adaptation. Adaptation must be a different version. It must change. Even we have that, the, the, the what? Um, for example, the adaptation of Hamlet, in, in Iran uh, called doubt. Ophelia does not kill herself, no. She even helps Hamlet a lot. Hamlet is very suicidal, he, she helps Hamlet. So even the plot is not exactly the same thing because the director decides to change things. We are having uh, some Hamlets which are all females. I mean, all of them are females playing different roles um, in, in Hamlet play. So it must not be the same. Previously, let's say, until the beginning of 21st century, people were looking for fidelity. They should be the same. This is the work. This is the adaptation. They should have a lot of similarities. But right now, it is out of fashion anymore. It is out of fashion. It's not fashionable anymore. So they should be different because the scenarist and the director and, and the actors, they have their own understanding and interpretations of the work. And okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Great to see the students. Okay, the movie sometimes loses some points of the original book, but it gives us a general image. Sometimes it gives us a very different image. As I told you, something, I mean, the, the work might be, might be what, might be a tragedy and they turn it into a comedy. I mean, totally different. And I'm in the same culture, example, BBC adaptation of Jane Eyre. Uh -huh. If it is the same culture still, see, you see BBC adaptation of Jane Eyre. The time that Jane Eyre was written, we didn't have any movies or TVs, but right now we have. Um, I had to recommend you to watch like different adaptations of Jane Eyre, one in 1990s, who is that William Hurt is playing there? And the other in, in 21st century, even the dress code of the women changes. Hmm? Even some parts in the 90s, in American 90s, there were a lot of emphasis on, on family life, on women getting married and caring about the family and whatever. So those parts related to the family are picked from Jane Eyre and shown in the movies. However, in 21st century, the emphasis is mostly on, on equality, also a little bit of love and whatever. Yet what is very important in all the adaptations of Jane Eyre is that this guy, I mean, Mr. Rochester is more than 20 years older than Jane Eyre. And Jane Eyre is almost a kid, but we never see that in the adaptations. Why? Because in late 20th century, early 21st century, it was common in 19th century, I mean, this age gap, 20, 30 years. But in today, I mean, late 20th century, early 21st century, it looks a little bit weird for us. So look at the way that the characters are chosen. I mean, the actors, the woman is never, she doesn't even look like 20 years younger. Okay. So, Department of English, Basra University, Mortava. So, let me see what is Mortava's question. 
Okay, Morteva. Okay. So some movies adaptations are limited and a lot of events I have answered that. Is there any boundaries for adaptation later? No, no. I mean, there is no boundary and this is the beauty of adaptation. Adaptation is boundless. There are even some adaptation, as I told you, death of a salesman. There are some people who do not even call that adaptation. They say, come on, it has nothing to do with adaptation. Um, the director mentioned that it is the adaptation. So even some theme, some small portion of a literary work can be adapted in another work. Handmaid's Tale, it is also adapted, yes. Uh, tell there are different adaptations of it. Each one is different from the other. Yes, we got like TV series as well, details, but it gives us the general information about the original novel. Um, in the adaptation, see, in whatever work we got, we got different themes and motifs. So some adaptations are, are augmenting some themes and minimizing some others. A very good example would be Shakespeare and Hamlet. Uh, did you know that Hamlet, uh, Richard III and Macbeth, they are used, bit, especially Hamlet, in the Arab world, they are used for a lot of political purposes. Uh, political motivations in the Arab world. It was very interesting for me to know that why Hamlet is so popular, it is because it is uh, politically charged. It can be used from political point of view a lot. Or also Dostoevsky, he is also popular in the Arab world. A lot of Iraqi people know that, but maybe some other writers are not that popular. A lot of writers which has, uh, which has some, uh, I mean, they, they are creating a specific setting and background, and that will add more to the receiving of these works. I mean, a lot of people would love to read that. James Joyce may not be popular in some countries, however, it might be very popular in some other. For example, Shafak, Elif Shafak, I think you know her, 40 Rules of Love, which has been translated into, into Arabic. And it was interesting that my students did not know Rumi or Molavi, but they all knew Shafak, and from Shafak, they knew Molavi. So is the history of English language related to German languages? Well, this is more to that. This is basically, that is a very good question. This is basically related to, I mean, your question is basically related to uh, linguistic. My specialty is cultural studies and literature, but I try to answer that. If we think in terms of Germanic languages and the way that they are rooted, I mean, English language is also rooted. Yes, they are related. Each adaptation reflects its culture. Yes, its culture and its time, definitely. Even if it tries its best to mimic the culture of that time, even if it, it tries its best. Look at the, again, I refer to different adaptations of Jane Eyre. Look, I mean, one adaptation in 20th century, one adaptation in 21st century, adaptation in early 20th century. The way that women are dressed up and men are dressed up is very much um, answering to the fashions of, uh, of that time. Political background, yes. So also in Turkey, Hamlet is also very popular in Turkey. As you remember in my um, previous slides that I have shown you the way that we got like a Arabic uh, <coughs> adaptation of Hamlet that I already referred to. So any other question? This is like Arabic, the Arabic adaptation that was after that. Yes, here we are. Just different multiple versions of one story next one, after this one. So especially uh, Suleiman. Alhamlet Summit, this one. Alhamlet Summit, okay? Let me see if we got any other question. No more? No more question? No more question? 
Okay, it seems yeah. it seems no more questions. This is Kian again. Thank you very much, Professor, for this lecture. And we hope to see you again, again in other lectures and to see you personally, either in the university or in our university. And I want, I would like to re-invite you to visit our university, you and all of your colleagues. Uh, you are all welcome in our city and in our university. Thank you again and uh, wish the best to you. You too, you're welcome back at RDC University and our department uh, and of course the Faculty of Letters and Humanities, Department of English. Uh, thank you everyone. Thank you for all your warm messages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see everyone again. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Dear students and colleagues, there is a link of participation. We will send a participation attendance certificates to your email. So please fill the form and be care about writing your emails because we will send the certificates to your emails directly. So thank you for all of you. And we will see you again in next lecture. Thank you. Goodbye. Inshallah. Goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye Mr. Kian. Goodbye. And goodbye to all my wonderful colleagues. Yeah, yeah.